A South African-born American biotech entrepreneur and investor wants to make the country the Singapore of Africa in the health and pharmaceutical space and believes the possibilities are endless. Hailing from Kabecha in the Eastern Cape, the Californian-based Dr. Patrick Sun Chiong earlier this year announced a three billion rand investment towards catalyzing South African technology, how, technological know-how rather, as it relates to vaccine development for COVID and beyond. In an exclusive interview, interview with the SABC's show in Rice Peace. He spoke about his vision for the country as a vaccine powerhouse using technology and innovation that could leapfrog South Africa in the pharmaceutical space. Dr. Patrick Sun Xiong, welcome to SABC News and thank you for your time. You're welcome. Glad to be here. You made a headline-grabbing announcement this week, committing three billion rand towards what you call catalyzing capacity building, self-sufficiency and innovation in COVID-19 vaccine production in South Africa. In more practical terms, where will this money go and what exactly will it do? Well, I think we're really working my way through the, the country and I've gone through, you know, having discussions with President Ramaphosa to the Minister of Health, Ministers of Science Innovation, Minister of Economic Development, and then with the scientific community uh, at the Miracle Research Council, together with uh, the universities of Cape Town, etc. So I think what I'm trying to learn is figure out what's the best utilization of this coalition of forces to harness the ingenuity of South Africa. Um, and we're working our way through that, frankly. And it's a combination of our philanthropy, which is our family foundation. So one of my goals is to create what I call a public good uh, organization, a PBO in, in South Africa. And the other goal is to figure out how we stand up uh, the pharmaceutical industry, Biovac and Aspen are the two uh, organizations. But what is very, very, very clear to me is um, the know-how, the intellectual knowledge, the human capital that is needed to come into the country and somebody to have the design, the will and the courage, frankly, to say uh, South Africans are a, a people of high ingenuity, um, high skills and if we could make South Africa the Singapore of Africa um, in the world of healthcare and pharmaceuticals and catalyze that, uh, then this three billion uh, initial uh, commitment could be the start of something really impactful. So give us a sense then of what you mean when you talk about this transfer of technology and, as you just said, the transfer of know-how. We hear this kind of language and terminology in the climate change space. What kinds of technology are we talking about here? Just how complex an endeavor this is really to get South Africa up to capacity when we talk about vaccine production and becoming a vaccine superpower in Africa. So look at the contrast of where I came and to where we are now. Uh, I trained at the Janswick General Hospital and then went to East London, your hometown, <laughs> and went into the TB clinics. And there were these, you know, iron, and, you know, iron rod beds with injections lined up of uh, anti-TB drugs, no x-rays, no nothing. And injecting these poor kids with uh, these so-called uh, anti-TB drugs and realizing that the technology doesn't exist in the country. Now, fast forward 30 years, I've been out in this country and now the world of genomics, artificial intelligence, computer, machine learning, automation has taken off. And I've had the fortunate capacity and capability in this country to be able to fortunately be involved with every one of those elements from the point of producing a million vials a day for a decade in the United States for cancer drugs and infective drugs and heparin to building supercomputing technology that actually can uh, interrogate the human genome to actually working on robotic systems that actually can automate production at cell level. That technology of artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, robotics, um, 
at the biological level of manufacturing next generation pharmaceutical products for the treatment of cancer and infectious diseases is here and now. So I've had the fortunate resources given to me almost as a gift to do this. And I think this is our mission now is to take this, this amazing knowledge that is not our knowledge, but the knowledge of the world of genomics and artificial intelligence and bring it to the country. So that is what I mean by tech transfer. It's, it's literally leapfrogging. Um, a, it's like leapfrogging wireless. It's leapfrogging you from 3G, 4G to 5G mm -hmm. <laughs> in the tech world, immediately in the world of pharmaceuticals. And I think we can do that. Given the courage, given the desire, given the uh, government will and the private sector will to do that. So given that we continue to be in this race, right, against mutations and the various variants that are emerging as it relates to coronavirus, you talk about the need for second generation vaccines. Talk a little bit about the potential you see for a country like South Africa in terms of vaccines and therapeutics and, and the diagnostic space around this uh, pandemic, not only from a healthcare perspective, but the longer term economic implications that can come from this? Well, you know, this is exactly the, the issue where, thankfully, for the last five years or eight years of my career, we've tried to pursue what I call the cancer vaccine. Now, that sounds crazy, but it's not, because it turns out that an infected cell like that of a COVID or TB or HIV versus a cancerous cell you and I have the same capability to protect ourselves against that by activating T cells and the thing called the natural killer cell. So unfortunately, the world of vaccinology, which is in the world of virology, has not evolved beyond antibodies. And antibody is a correlate protection. And you look at the vaccines today, um, egg-based vaccines all the way to even mRNA are all trying to activate antibodies. Antibodies may prevent, to some degree, the entry of the virus, but it doesn't prevent the killing of the infected cell, which means you need the T cell. And what I mean by second generation vaccines is to drive your body to activate T cells specifically to that infected cell. And that's what we've done uh, in our, at least, protocol. That's what we've done in cancer. And that's what I want to do, not just for COVID, TB, systemiasis, HPV, diseases, tropical diseases that affect Africa, which has been basically neglected in the Western world because it's not here. Because it's Africa. Right. So the opportunity then to bring second generation, not just for COVID, but for schistosomiasis, hookworm, Lassa fever, chikungunya, uh, words that probably are foreign to most Western societies, but impact millions and millions of people in Africa. Um, is what I want to catalyze. I mean, are you actually saying that South Africa could be at the forefront of a possible future cancer vaccine as broad as that might, and impossible as that might sound? Absolutely. I can just give you some insights into where we've done now. We've, we spent the last five years with the National Cancer Institute in the United States. Um, we are in uh, clinical trials. We've tested 1,800 patients uh, right now in the United States. We are in 25 phase two, three clinical trials. We have now complete remission uh, data on pancreatic cancer, complete remission in triple negative breast cancer, complete remissions in head and neck cancer. So this is not theory any longer. Uh, now, obviously we have to validate these in what we call randomized clinical trials, which we are doing in the United States. But why wait? Why then allow then just Western societies to have access to this technology? So my goal is then to bring it um, um, home, so to speak, um, and create the human capital to understand and build on this technology. It's always going to be your home, so you can you can bring it home, so to speak, Dr. Sun Xiong. Let me ask you about the current. 
uh, negotiations at the World Trade Organization as it relates to intellectual property waivers. Uh, you talked about how this is not obviously just about IP waivers. This is also about the transfer of technology. What's your reading on the ongoing negotiations at the WTO? Of course, uh, there's the counter argument that says this is possibly going to undermine innovation, research uh, and, and, and development. What does success look like for both sides at the end of this? Look, I think um, while that's an, imp an important step, it's not the step. I mean, it may sound counterintuitive. Let's say you waive the patents. Um, that's great. Now, what do you do with a piece of paper uh, when there's no know-how, no knowledge, no technology, no transfer, no ability to scale? So what we don't want to do is lose sight of what the real goal is. The real goal is great self-sufficiency and capacity. If that means that part of that is, is a patent wavering, but it's probably not necessary. The vaccinology of today, of, of the yesteryear, is so old that many people can do that independent of IP. What we need to do is look to the future and actually create, as I said, next generation vaccines. So my fear is that you get caught up in this political discussion Rather, and then you, 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 you lose your, your way. What the World Trade Organization can do and what the, the World Bank can do and the African National Bank can do is help support government organizations for not only financing, but breaking the red tape, breaking customs barriers, breaking import barriers, but under very, very, very strict regulated lines so that you don't get crazy stuff going back and forth. So I think these are the, the you know, I'm, I'm sort of very much into a do tank kind of way rather than a think tank kind of way. <laughs> and that's what I try to say at this at this meeting. And, uh, you know, Dr. Yodi, who uh, chaired both, um, is the perfect spokesperson to understand the need. And as I said to her, Africa can and Africa will. And it's not with patents, it's with real action. A do tank instead of a think tank. I really like that. I mean, I guess at the heart of this, right, is the, the disparity we're seeing in terms of vaccine administration around the world. Just look at the comparison between the US and South Africa. 260 million doses have been administered here. And if you look at South Africa, about 430,000, looking at 40% that have received uh, two doses in the United States, fully vaccinated and less than 1% in your home country that's at the core of what's going on at the WTO in terms of uh, multilateral negotiations right now. How do we solve that issue now? Well, I think what COVID's done, right, is, is really unveiled the whole issue of health inequities. Um, and, you know, as Martin Luther King said, you know, healthcare is a human right. <laughs> so we uh, need to address that systemically, meaning, you know, we can't just, you're right, um, the inequities of hoarding vaccines when there's a surplus supply and not allowing um, other countries to have access to it, or maybe having access to maybe uh, less effective vaccines is just not equitable, but it is what it is. I think, again, I'm such a pragmatic person, it is what it is. What you need to do is then take a proactive step and say, let's go manufacture your own under, under, uh, in, in a way that, by the way, supersedes the current vaccines. The current vaccines do not prevent infection uh, in terms of transmission. They are fantastic. So I, I am not an anti-vaccinologist. I'm very important for you, everybody to know they must and should take these vaccines because they do reduce mortality. So they are effective in that sense. But we need to go very quickly to this next generation. We've got a little breathing room. South Africa, by the way, should be credited for alerting to the world to these variations and mutations. And that speaks to the strength of the science in South Africa. And these mutations, unfortunately, are going to evolve because that's what these viruses do. And when we have a vaccine that just goes after the antibodies, but not kill the infected cell, the T cell, you may win the battle shortly, but you're not going to win the war. So while you don't have the vaccines, and my hope is that the World Trade Organization and World Bank and World Health Organization find a way that we don't have this tragedy in Brazil and India and, God willing, not in Africa, 
that <clears throat> we've got a little window, not much, to go. But there is no, there's no short-term fix here, is what you're saying, right? There's not a short-term fix, and so this, what we're saying, is that we've unearthed these inequities, and now is a moment in time to fix it, but not for just today, but for the next generation, mm -hmm. and not just for COVID, for TB. People don't realize that TB kills in South Africa and Africa more. 20% to 50% of the population, young population, were affected with TB, get reinfected. Um, so we, we need to address this systemically. And that's why I've taken this um, on as a challenge uh, of when I say catalyzing this next generation of technology into the country. How do you think South Africa has handled this pandemic? I mean, you talk about your conversations with various uh, levels of government uh, and, and civil society and the, the medical fraternity there. What's your sense of how they've managed this pandemic? I think they've managed it remarkably well considering the resources and the, and, and the capacity. When President Ramaphosa shut the country down, when you, you, the, the mask wearing, the responsibility. And that's, I think, is the beauty of South Africans. They care about each other. They really do. And as opposed to the selfishness um, uh, that you see in, in, in different parts of the world. So I think they've handled it fantastically. The scientific community has handled it fantastically. The Minister of Health, the President, the Minister of Science Innovation. Um, and now, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, Aspen and Bivec, they can only do what they have. And... Um, um, Aspen done a fantastic job in rolling out the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Um, and now you need to go upstream. Um, so in general, I think they've handled as well as they could with the resources that they have. A couple more questions for you, Doc. You described yourself as a South African born Chinese Asian American, born in a country with deep racial disparities and eventually ending up in a country uh, with deeply embedded structural racial issues that in the last year has seen Asian Americans the target of much hate linked in the main to ignorance around coronavirus. What's your observations been given your very unique personal story and trajectory given your relationship with both countries? Well, I think, you know, I, I mean, I've now made it public, right? I mean, I have a sort of different responsibility uh, as this AAA, Asian American African, <laughs> uh, and understanding the pain that South Africa went through. I personally went through that. Unless you have and lived it and have the empathy, you really couldn't understand it from the other side. Um, so that was one uh, perspective lens. The other is South Africans, I believe, has gone through a level of enlightenment that has actually exceeded that of the United States because what Man, you know, President Mandela did with reconciliation and not hating back, and it was so easy uh, for him to have done that and created this reconciliation and understanding. So I visited the country quietly a couple of years ago uh, with my family and saw the beauty of these young people who never grew up in apartheid and really, color doesn't matter. They were joyous uh, um, and compatible, and I think enlightened. So I unfortunately think uh, this Asian hate here that you're seeing now in, in our country is a reflection of the fabric of how the country grew. It grew up in the fabric of slavery and, 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 and racial discrimination, which I don't think it's actually recognized. And so if it has to recognize it, have empathy and address it, and I said, and then break it. Um, but maybe that's why I'm coming home. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great that you say that because that was kind of my next question. You tweeted this video of the Jerusalem Dance Challenge a couple of days ago, uh, saying this quote, uh, this makes me homesick, Ikayalami, which means, you know, my home. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask how often you get back there and uh, when are you moving back permanently? <laughs> I don't know if I can move back permanently. I think because I think I have a responsibility for the, both countries. I think, um, but I do know I will be moving. Uh, and President Ramaphosa asked me when, and I said yesterday. <laughs> 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 and, you know, look, I'm a surgeon. I, I, I want to have things done like yesterday, uh, and when, especially when people are dying. 
So I'm actually working literally 24-7 uh, with different elements of the country, whether it be the government, whether it be uh, academia, whether it be societies, whether it be um, even hospitals, and trying to piece together very quickly this coalition that we will soon announce. Um, but I'm trying to be very practical about it. This is not, you know, a policy think tank. This is not an ego organization. This is about how can we qu quickly save lives? Uh, and how do we most quickly make impact? And then how do we work with organizations like SAFRA, which has been fantastic? Um, how do we bring regulations in that are, are very, very um, uh, um, controlled so that it is, it's not done irresponsibly um, and scientifically? So the answer is, yeah, and it, it did make me homesick, this Jerusalem. One day you and I are going to have to do this dance. I'm not sure. We <laughs> But I spoke to uh, the vice chancellor and I was taken by her as Mama Khetti. Uh, uh, University of Cape Town. Yeah, and, uh, by her dance. And it's yeah. so wonderful. It's basically a prayer when you think about it. If you look at the words in English, if those who don't, it's a prayer. It's a fantastic, beautiful prayer. Dr. Patrick Soon Xiong, Chairman of the Chan Soon Xiong Family Foundation, CEO and Chairman of Immunity Bio and Nant Health, Executive Chairman of Nant Quest, and Executive Chairman of the California Times, also known as a Triple A Africa Asian American. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome.